In reality, though, Satan's motives were selfish. He wanted Adam and Eve and their future offspring to submit to and worship him rather than worship Jehovah. But what had he done for them? It was Jehovah who had given them everything they had, each other, their beautiful garden home, and their perfect bodies with the potential of living forever. Sadly, Adam and Eve disobeyed God, cutting themselves off from him. The results, as you know, were tragic. Like flowers cut from a plant, they slowly began to wither and die. Their children also suffered from the curse of sin. Even so, most people still choose not to submit to God. They want to live their own way. The results clearly show that there is no wisdom in opposition to Jehovah. Okay. As mentioned, our first subheading, there is no wisdom in opposition to Jehovah. Paragraphs 3 and 4. How did heeding bad advice affect Adam and Eve and their descendants? Sister Garrett. Garrett. So Jehovah had given Adam and Eve everything that had put them <coughs> home and their perfect bodies and their potential for living forever. And here came this presumptuous self appointed advisor and he told them that, that they would be happier if they chose a different life. And so then um, this was selfish. And so here we are in the conditions that we are today. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or more. In reality, <clears throat> Satan was a, a stranger uh, to Adam and Eve, basically. So the paragraph says, what had they done? Or what had he done for them? In reality, Jehovah had done everything for them. So it helps us to understand the importance of following the counsel of Jehovah and reaping the positive benefit, but they chose to do opposite. Mm -hmm. Good. Sister Garden? And he also encouraged them to follow their heart, their perfect thinking. Um, we see there that in the previous paragraph, it brought out that many are the plans in a man's heart, but the counsel of Jehovah is what will prevail. And that goes hand in hand with that there is no wisdom in opposition to Jehovah. He knows us more than we know ourselves. So if we follow our heart, we're going to fail. If we follow what Jehovah says, we will be successful. Yes. Good. Sister Milo? And that's the choice as descendants we have to take a look at because if we continue to follow our heart, we will fail. But um, And then continue, as uh, Ephesians brings out, we can continue to be children of wrath and actually be dead to Jehovah. The only opportunity we have of really having life and doing better is if we um, put on the, the teachings of Christ and follow in that. So we, we, we still, as a descendants, have a choice to make. Yes, good. And so how many sisters like flowers? Raise your hand. Love flowers. Ever received some beautiful flowers? What example do we have, in essence, what Adam and Eve did and how that compared with flowers? Sister White? It brought out how uh, once the flower has been cut off from uh, the plant, it begins to wither and die. And that's the same thing that uh, happens to mankind. Mm -hmm. Once they cease to worship Jehovah and live by his standards, we also cease to die, especially because of our four parents, Adam and Eve. Yeah, so you see what happened to our descendants, right? And so what do you sisters usually do, right? When you have those beautiful flowers, you change the water, right? To keep them pretty, right? But then you might put what in it? What what do some people put in there? So, <laughs> Sister Collins? Sometimes an aspirin. Yeah, they put aspirin in there, right? They say, look, that'll help keep them a little bit, to revive them a little bit, right? But eventually, what what happens? You No matter what you do, you want those flowers to keep looking beautiful. But what ends up happening? Sister Jones? Well, the flowers have been cut from their life source. So they're going to end up dying anyways, no matter what you do. So the same with Adam and Eve, they disobeyed God, cutting themselves off from him. So they cut cut themselves off from the source of life, which was Jehovah. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, isn't that true? That's what usually happens with with humans. Get plastic surgery. They try to keep looking youthful, don't they? The figurative aspirin in the water, so to speak. And regardless of what you do, no matter what you do, 10 years, 20 years later, still that wilting, right? It's like So likewise, we today, if we cut ourselves off from our spiritual life force, then we'll, we'll wither and die. Um, if we turn away from Jehovah's organization and study and program, just like the brother is doing, we will wither and die. We'll start getting the attitude of the world. We'll start being negative. So this is something that we really need to concentrate on, how important it is to stay in, in uh, contact with our spiritual family. Yes, okay, good. Let's move on to our next paragraph, paragraph five, and see what confidence Jehovah has in his human creation. Still, Jehovah knew that some humans, including many fine young people, would search for him and serve him. How he cherishes such ones. Do you count yourselves among them? If so, you are no doubt enjoying many good things from God that contribute greatly to your happiness. As we shall now see, these good things include an abundance of fine spiritual food, the very best kind of friends, worthwhile goals, and true freedom. Okay, we're going to ask Brother Larry to read for Psalm 103, verse 5, when we call for it. Our question to paragraph 5. What confidence did God have in his human creation, and, with, and was this confidence justified? Sister Bumpkin? Well, we know that Jehovah knew that some of the humans, including the young ones, would find him and serve him. Okay. Yes. Good. Let's take a look at Psalm 103, verse 5. It's such a beautiful scripture. Brother Larry, can you read that for us, please? Sure. It says, he satisfies you with good things all your life, so that your youth is renewed like that of an eagle. Okay, let's keep that in mind. Now, with reference to our paragraph, how does this scripture really help us to appreciate the things that we're considering? Jehovah's confidence being justified in this human creation. Brother Embry? Brother Embry? I mean, when we think about what that young man is, is looking at up there, those spiritual goals, those are going to make him happy. There's no greater happiness than serving Jehovah. Um, he may, if he went the other route, he may have a nice new car or a big house or uh, whatever that may be, but he's not going to have the friends that he has within the congregation, the best friends you could ever have. Uh, he's not... He may, you know, take himself away from that spiritual paradise, and he's not going to have the true freedom that we have in Jehovah's uh, organization now today, because people in the world don't have that freedom. Yes, yeah, very good. And true or false? With Psalm 103, verse five, Jehovah will satisfy you temporarily. Is that how? That's how long He wants to do it. Is that true or false? Sister Taylor? It, it's false because he satisfies you with good things all of your life. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Brother Williams is back. <clears throat> he has this confidence because he set in place and the my sister brought out in place for forever. So he knew that some would, would, would um, follow his principles. And therefore, he had that confidence in mankind, those people. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, good. Brother uh, Chapel. Okay, so going back to that point that Jehovah is going to satisfy us with good things all our life, as the brother mentioned, if we contrast that on the left side, where if he goes to college or whatever, and he gets a good job, that's still not going to satisfy him. It may satisfy him temporarily, but we see that in the world all the time. People have uh, a lot of money. They may buy new houses, new cars, but they continually have to do that. It doesn't satisfy them. But Jehovah is going to satisfy us all our life. Yes, very good. Friends, we've got to move on to our next subheading. Jehovah satisfied your spiritual need, paragraph 6. Unlike the animals, you have a spiritual need, which only your creator can satisfy. When you listen appreciatively to him, you gain insight, wisdom, and happiness. 
Happy are those conscious of their spiritual need, Jesus said. God satisfies your spiritual need by means of his word and the abundance of spiritual food that he provides through the faithful and discreet slave. And how varied and rich that food is. Okay. Our subheading, Jehovah satisfies your spiritual need. Paragraph 6. Why should you care for your spiritual need? And how does Jehovah provide for you? Brother Gardner? When, when we take in spiritual food, we're able to gain insight and wisdom. And along with that, Jesus said, happy are those conscious of their spiritual need as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, good. Brother Garrett? Yeah, there are about these four four. It, it, it explains it too. It says that uh, man must not live on bread alone, but of every word that comes from Jehovah's mouth. And that's what leads us. That's what make, makes us happy and grow. As a people for Jehovah's name. Mm -hmm. Yes, very good. Brother Carthor? <clears throat> we see we get our spiritual needs satisfied, handed down to us by the faithful and discreet slave through Holy Spirit. So once we're conscious of that, that in turn will make us very happy spiritually. Mm -hmm. Yes, good. Sister Gardner? And we can't just expect that if we uh, tour through the Bible that everything's going to work out. As, a, as mentioned in the paragraph, we have to listen appreciatively. We have to truly love God's word and want to apply it, they apply it daily and follow exactly what Jehovah says. Then things will be successful. We, it's not going to be successful through osmosis. Yes, very good. Sister uh, Embry? And Jehovah provides for us so much spiritually, and it's up to us to take advantage of that. We don't starve spiritually in Jehovah's organization. One sister brought out the kingdom call coming to the meetings is her spiritual lifeline, and because he's given us so much because he loved us. Okay, yes, yeah, very good. We're going to ask, move on to our next paragraph, seven, and we're going to ask um, Brother, uh, <coughs> Brother Hayes to read for us. Proverbs 2, verses 10 through 14. Let's go on to paragraph 7. The spiritual food that God provides will give you wisdom and thinking ability, which can protect you in many ways. For example, these qualities open your eyes to false teachings, such as the view that there is no creator. They protect you against the lie that money and possessions are the key to happiness. And they help you to recognize and resist wrong desires and self-destructive behavior. So continue to search for godly wisdom and thinking ability, viewing them as treasures. As you acquire those precious qualities, you will come to know from personal experience that Jehovah loves you and wants the very best for you. Okay. Paragraph 7. What are some benefits that come from absorbing spiritual food that God provides? Sister. It, it helps give us the wisdom and thinking ability to protect us in many ways. Because uh, protecting us, the open eyes and the false teaching. Mm -hmm. Yes, very good. Sister Hemingway? And my favorite scripture is Psalms 34 uh, 8, taste Jehovah and see is he good. So by requiring that um, the thinking ability, we could uh, require those precious qualities and we would know that we shouldn't go that, you know, keep away from the things that keep us um, in a view of different things, but we see things as a treasure in Joseph's eyes. Mm -hmm. Good. I invite you to turn to Proverbs chapter 2. <clears throat> Let's uh, read that and then we'll get some comments on Proverbs 2, 10 through 14. When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge becomes pleasant to your soul, thinking ability will keep watch over you and discernment will safeguard you to save you from the bad course 
from the man speaking perverse things, from those leaving the upright paths to walk in the ways of darkness, from those who rejoice in wrongdoing, who find joy in the perverseness of evil. Okay. Now, what do we, what can we appreciate with regard to Proverbs as far as wisdom when it truly grabs hard of us, hold of us, and we are so <laughs> in it? Sister uh, Jill? So it brings out uh, number 11. It says, thinking ability will keep watch over you and discernment will safeguard you. So that helps us to recognize what bad desires are. It helps us to desist and to turn away from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. And uh, Brother Larry? It also shows the way we view these things. Uh, we could take in all the knowledge we want. Uh, it will only just be knowledge. We have to turn it into wisdom. At the beginning of the scripture, it says, when it becomes pleasant to your soul. Uh, so when we think about Jehovah's ways, if they're pleasant to us, then they, we will look at them in a way that can help us. And it will, uh, in verse 13, it says, uh, it will, uh, for those leaving the upright paths to walk in the ways of darkness, that's when people don't appreciate and don't let that uh, knowledge sink in and become wisdom. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. And in verse 12, very good comments, friends, on these on the scriptures. What will it save you from, and what kind of man? Sister Moore? It brings out it to save you from the bad course, from the man speaking perverse things. And we can see that how Jehovah loves us. This, All these verses here is protections for us. And Jehovah gave us this um, for us to study, for us to gain wisdom and understanding. Mm -hmm. Yes. Brother Kate? The, the verse really emphasizes that in our lives, there are going to be many paths that we can take. Uh, whether we're in the truth mm -hmm. or not, there's still decisions that we have to make. And certainly we need to be on guard. And that's why, as verse 11 helps us appreciate that the scriptures provide discernment. And we study and we take it in, we meditate on it. We can discern what areas that could lead us to a wrong path. And we can stay on the right course. And this is especially true for, for young people who are inexperienced. Mm -hmm. Yes. And think about that, that protecting you from all those things. And mentioned, too, from the perverse, more speaking perverse thing. What does that mean, perverse? <clears throat> Brother Ubaya? It's a deliberate or a obstinate desire to engage in things that are unreasonable or unacceptable. From the uh, from a from a reasoning stamp uh, for a standpoint, mm -hmm. yeah. Despite the consequences, despite people seeing the consequences, they become unreasonable, undesirable, they're obstinate. And in fact, the insight book points obstination or stubbornness is like divination. Imagine that, you know. So, <coughs> we, what are the protection that we have from these things? Okay, I saw. Yeah, was that was that you, Sister Larry? Yeah. Okay. Don't be afraid to keep raising your hands. <laughs> Sister Milo. Just thinking of the, uh, there's a, uh, uh, young athletes uh, that go to the prestigious school, one in particular, it was so televised, you went to a Asian country and they stole things from a store. And this child was wealthy, came from a wealthy family, but embarrassed his family, his school, and himself, and caught on camera. But money, all the privileges, and uh, he even said he did something perverse. And it now has lived on in history. So we can see how foolish it is to not have morality as a base for our lives. Okay, yes. And in verse 10, it mentions that where, what has to happen with this knowledge, this wisdom? The absorption, Sister Taylor? <laughs> It's just the wisdom has to enter your heart. And as the paragraph brings out, it says, as you um, acquire these qualities, you'll come to know from personal experience. So as wisdom goes into your heart and there's different situations that come up, um, different Bible principles through that personal experience, and you put into action what you learn, you'll see how Jehovah is real to you in your, in your life. Yes, yeah, very good. Let's move on to paragraph eight. 
Soon, every part of Satan's world will come crashing down, and Jehovah will be our only security. Indeed, the time may come when we will depend on him for our very next meal. Yes, now is the time to draw close to your heavenly Father and strengthen your trust in him. If you do, then no matter what happens around you, you will feel as did the psalmist, David, who wrote, I keep Jehovah before me constantly. Because he is at my right hand, I will never be shaken. Paragraph 8. Why should you draw close to God now? And how will this benefit you in the future? Sister Thompson. We should draw close to God now because Satan's world is deteriorating. So Jehovah will be the only will be would be our only security. Interesting, the paragraph states that the time will come when we may depend on Jehovah for our next meal. Yeah. For the garden. In subjects like this, I personally like to think of it like a person who's training for an event, maybe a runner or a some type of athlete, how they train is how they're going to perform when the event happens. So for example, maybe a marathon, if a sprinter doesn't train for long distance, they're not going to make the marathon because they train to sprint. If we've trained ourselves, and this especially for our young ones, to look at the world, celebrities, money as the key of success, then when this system crumbles, we're not trained to look to Jehovah, and he's going to be the only one that can help us out of this. Yes, yeah, good. Sister Nat. We can go back to that point in the Garden of Eden about how Satan hadn't done anything for Adam and Eve. We can think about that for us today. We can see that Satan has done nothing for anyone in this world but that. So what do we see that Jehovah has done for his people over the centuries? So that can help us to build that confidence knowing that the only hope that we have is to build that trust in Jehovah now. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so if we continue to strengthen our trust in Jehovah, as mentioned there in the paragraph, we will feel like the song was David. How did he feel? Sister Collins? He says, I will keep Jehovah before me constantly, and because he is at my right hand, I will never be shaken. So that's the protection and uh, that Jehovah finds us. Yes. Confidence, too, isn't it? Uh, Brother Baker? It really does help us to appreciate the closeness that David had, that relationship that David had with Jehovah for him to um, say what he said. The closeness showed how close he was with Jehovah. Yes, very good. Okay, our next subheading, Jehovah gives you the very best kinds of kind of friends. Paragraph 9. Jehovah draws down those whom he allows to become members of his spiritual family gently attracting honest-hearted ones to true worship. When you first meet someone who is not in the truth, what do you know about that person? Other than his name and physical appearance, probably very little. That is not the case when you first meet someone who knows and loves Jehovah. Even if that person is from a different background, country, tribe, or culture, you already know much about him and he about you. Hey, let's get a reader for John 6, 44. Read that for us, Brother Garrett. <coughs> no man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. I, and I will res, uh, resurrect him on the day, last day. Okay. <coughs> Paragraph 9, our A question. According to John 6, 44, what does Jehovah do? Brother Latour. Jehovah, <clears throat> Jehovah draws those whom he allows to become members of his spiritual family, generally attracting honest hearted ones to true worship. Yeah. Sister Jones? I appreciate your he gently attracts honest hearted ones. So that's really important. He does that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. Our B question, what is unique about meeting other witnesses? Brother Carthon? It's unique because we all serve Jehovah God out of love. 
So wherever we go, no matter what tribe, nation, tongue, we all worship the same God out of love, Jehovah God. Yes, good. Anything else unique? I'm meeting other witnesses. Brother Entz? Um, you guys have the same perspective in, on the big picture. Um, at my new job, there's another co-worker at a different property who is a Jehovah's Witness. And already I've had two different people say, you know, are you guys related? Is you guys talk and, and say a lot of the same things? I've only met him twice, but yeah, he's a, he's a brother out in Antioch. And that kind of perspective that you have, other people can tell it too, that we truly are brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. So you told me you are related, huh? Yeah. That's right. We are related. Very good. Brother, um, just say it for me. Gather the dirt. <laughs> um, we know that sometimes there will be a call from the from the platform to uh, those brothers coming from other lands that need a place to stay, and you know they we never met them, but we hand them a key and let them into our house and not worry about anything. If you were at work or the the person at your favorite coffee shop was like, I need someone to stay. Can you open your house? You'd be like, get lost. So, but when it comes to our brotherhood, we can trust them, and we don't even know who they are when they come into our house. Sister, let me have your name. It's Sterling. And then, um, two, the bottom line is we just always need to go back to John 644. If Jehovah drew them in, then we too should accept them just that simply, no matter, like we've been talking about, where they come from, who they are. They're one of Jehovah's Witnesses, just like we are, so um, we have that connection there through that. Yes, good. Father Faith? And I was just going to comment on the picture. Uh, obviously, this is a convention, and most likely these friends have never met each other. They just said, they just took a seat um, and they're sitting across from one another, uh, they're smiling, there's no awkwardness there as you normally would have maybe in the world, trying to figure somebody out, because you know you have that one thing in common, and that's a love for Jehovah, so that's what resonates when we're together. Yeah. How many of your sisters are guarding your purse right now? I mean, you might have to, you know, in some cases, right? But not for the most part, right? You're not worried about, uh, Brother Larry taking your purse. <laughs> not worried about Brother Hayes taking your purse. Brother Embry, right? So you're not worried about it. You said you relax. And you're not even looking behind you to check to make sure it's safe, are you? Back to Brother Carter at the back door back there. And the door's locked. So we can really, there's so many blessings that we, we never will forget. We, Jehovah provides the very best kinds of friends. Like you see with the picture there, the friends are enjoying a meal together. And uh, it's not just one group of kinds of friends, right? It's not just all young people. You have some in the middle and some kind of a little bit older, right? So some very good things to think about. Let's go on to paragraphs 10 and 11 and see what Jehovah's people have in common. For example, you quickly recognize each other's language, the pure language of truth. As a result, you each know what the other believes about God, moral standards, and the hope for the future, to name just a few. Moreover, those are the most important things to know about a person, the things that build confidence and trust. They also form the basis for wholesome and enduring friendships. It is no exaggeration to say that as a worshiper of Jehovah, you have the very best kind of friends. And they are all around the world. It is just that you have yet to meet most of them. Who other than Jehovah's people enjoy this precious gift? Wow. Paragraph 10 and 11. What do Jehovah's people have in common? And how does this benefit us? Sister Chapel? We all as Jehovah's people have the same father. We've all been being educated the same. We're all being disciplined the same if needed. And so with this, that draws us together as a father. And so no matter where we go, we are literally brothers and sisters. That's right, very good. Other, um, Brian Mark. We also uh, recognize each other's language. The way we speak is the same. 
um, we know what each other's beliefs. We have the same moral standards. We believe that God is the creator, not uh, some odd, weird um, evolution theory. We uh, aren't confused in, in that respect. And um, those are the most important things to us. We know that they stand on the same platform that we stand on. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Furthermore, and how comforting it is to know that uh, we think we got our best friend, but Job says, "No, there's nothing. There's more out there. You just haven't met him yet." Mm -hmm. That's right, Brother Embry. Um, other Embry, the uncle. <laughs> Embry's uncle. Embry's uncle. <laughs> I was thinking, what a, what a beautiful thing, pure language. So in the next two days, we have a brother like you conducting this watch tower on over 100,000 congregations. And we have 197 outlines. We have a brother like Brother Embry, or you other brothers here, that will give a talk of a pure language in over 100,000 congregations. So in the point that says, who other than Jehovah's people enjoy this precious gift? Nobody. Jehovah's people are a family, and we are provided spiritual thinking. Think like Jehovah. What are, it's just sort of mind-boggling to think about sometimes. Yes. Okay, very good. Brother Nat? I appreciate the hope for the future. Um, in the world, many may have the same hope, but then they want this leader to, to bring it. They want that leader to bring it, and it separates them. But us, we have the same king who's going to bring all these things. And he's not going to be taken out of that uh, rulership until he hands back over to his father. So that hope for the future, that really unites us. Good. So in paragraph 11, what is no exaggeration? We are not exaggerating. Sister Campbell? It truly is not an exaggeration to know that we have worshipers of Jehovah all around the world that can be the best kind of friends. And it's definitely a privilege. We can go to different countries, different states. Friends accept you into your home. Don't even speak the same language. And I can say from personal experience, it's a beautiful thing to enjoy these special bonds within Jehovah's organization. Yes, very good. Okay, let's move on to our next uh, subheading. Jehovah gives you worthwhile goals. But before we do that, uh, let's get a reader for Ecclesiastes 11, 9 to 12, 1. Who would like to read that for us? Get uh, Sister... Jones? Lewis. Just Lewis. And have that scripture here. So we invite you to turn there. Ecclesiastes 11. We'll read verses 9 to 12, verse 1. It reads, Rejoice, young man, while you are young, and let your heart be glad in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart, and go where your eyes lead you. But know that the true God will bring you into judgment for all these things. So remove troublesome things from your heart and ward off harmful things from your body. For youth and the prime of your life are futility. Remember then your grand creator in the days of your youth before the days of distress comes and the years arrive when you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Okay, thank you. Let's go on to paragraph 12. Do you have one or more spiritual goals that you are working toward? Perhaps you are trying to read portions of the Bible each day, or you may be trying to improve your speaking and teaching abilities. Whatever the case, when you see positive results, or others see them and commend you, how do you feel? No doubt you feel a sense of achievement and joy, and so you should, in no small part because you are putting God's will ahead of your own in imitation of Jesus. Hey, our subheading, Jehovah gives you worthwhile goals. What fine spiritual goals can you set for yourself? Brother Mubai? You can set worthwhile goals such as reading portions of the Bible every day or improving your speaking, ability, speaking and teaching ability. You can plan to pioneer once when you can, and you can even plan to... Uh, reach out so that can all that can all be spiritual goals that can that you can uh, do for yourself mm -hmm. Good. sister chapel 
And we need to apply and work at making these our spiritual goals so that we can see advancement because all of this makes us better servants of Jehovah and able to carry out the responsibilities that he's given us of preaching the good news of the kingdom. Yes, good. In Ecclesiastes 11, what will Jehovah require of us? Verse 9. Shows responsibility. Brother Jones, in the back. Well, I remember reading this as a young man, and uh, I knew that uh, at the time that Jehovah would require judgment for the decisions that I made. So I started pioneering at the high school. So uh, saying now, Jehovah will require young people to uh, make decisions that would not bring them harm. And so uh, that's why these goals that are mentioned in the paragraph could help help a young person because in Jehovah's organization, Holy Spirit is here. You can make improvement, you can improve, but out there in the world, uh, you the decisions you make, it won't be the good. Okay, thank you. And in verse 10, Jehovah tells the young people to do what? And then it mentions something about youth. Sister, um, give me your last name again. Broadway. Mm -hmm. Sister Broadway. That it's okay for them to be free and make those choices, but they have to be accountable for those choices. So they want to do things according to Jehovah's way and will. We don't want to have too many troublesome things going on in our life like the brother mentioned. Yes, you can be sexual and moral, but there's a lot of consequences and a big cost that come with that. And a lot of those things he mentioned in his talk, the disease, death, so many things are going to happen. So rather than put yourself through that, just follow Jehovah and listen. Yeah. Okay, good. And so the latter part of verse 10 says, what will happen if you ward off troublesome things and <clears throat> harmful things of your body? What about, what's it say there about youth? That lasts forever? <clears throat> Sister Lizarelli? No, youth does not last forever because also there in the last paragraph, when you get older, it says, I have no pleasure in them. So when you're young, you should listen to the counsel from the Bible and do your best when you're young because that's when you have your health, you have energy, you have uh, the brain to uh, assimilate all of these wonderful things, and then you will have joy in serving Jehovah. Good. Thank you, Sister Lizarelli. Sister, you know I love you. Go ahead. <laughs> Sister Smith. <laughs> also, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Also, for our Proverbs brings out 2711. It brings out, be wise, my son, and make my heart rejoice so that I can make a reply for him, a reply, make a reply to him who trotted me. So we could appreciate this scripture because no doubt that um, a you, um, the young and the old will see sense of achievement and joy if we follow the scripture. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. All right. And as you should, as mentioned the latter part of that paragraph, what is no small part of it when you have that sense of achievement, accomplishing those spiritual goals? What does it say there? Sister Chapel? It shows that we are imitating Jesus by putting Jehovah's will before our own. Yes. All right. Let's go to paragraph 13. <clears throat> by focusing on spiritual pursuits, you are also doing a work that is truly satisfying because it is not in the least futile. The Apostle Paul wrote, Be steadfast, immovable, always having plenty to do in the work of the Lord knowing that your labor is not in vain in connection with the Lord. By comparison, a life marked by secular ambitions and pursuits, even if these seem very successful, is ultimately a life of futility. Someone who proved that to himself and to us was King Solomon. Paragraph 13, compared with secular pursuits, what makes serving God special and unique? Brother Gardner? 
Well, uh, unlike um, the success that we could have in the world, it'll be truly satisfying and not futile. We could have all the success, um, all the fortune or fame, money in the world, and it won't in the end really matter. It's still going to be futility. So it's not the case with the work we do in Jehovah's uh, uh, Spend organization. Yeah, so very good. Father Embry? Here in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, and the italicized, it says, your labor is not in vain in connection with the Lord. That's because when we're doing Jehovah's work, he's going to remember us. Uh, whether, you know, we, we may die in this system of things, the new system of things, he's going to remember us. He'll remember, uh, as it brought out earlier, the great tribulation is going to come out come around and then where is our relationship with Jehovah? If we built that relationship first, he's going to be with us right and through that. Yes. Now's the time, friends. Now's the time. Jehovah's equipping us now with things, especially you young people. Don't allow the things and the futile things of this system of things to invade your direction to cause you to go off course. But remember, strengthen yourself now because the time is going to come. We're not going to be able to be here, baby. Might not have your Bible, and you cannot recall any scriptures if you don't read the Bible regularly. The Holy Spirit is not going to pour a miracle down upon your brain, and now you can read and recite the Bible. You have to regularly read the Bible. So let's keep that and apply it. So we want to apply the Bible, live, practice now, living as a Christian. Okay, very good. Let's go on to paragraph 14. Fabulously rich and powerful, Solomon embarked on an experiment to try out pleasure and see what good would come. He built houses, designed gardens and parks, and pursued whatever he desired. How did he feel afterward? Contented? Fulfilled? Satisfied? We need not guess. Solomon himself told us. He wrote, when I reflected on all the works that my own hands had done, I saw that everything was futile. There was nothing of real value. What a powerful lesson. Will you wisely take it to heart? 14. What can you learn from Solomon's experiment with pleasures? Brother Gardner? The lesson there is uh, pursuing pleasures, prioritizing them, is a waste of time. It's futile. Uh, this example here is the excellent one of Solomon because he had the funds and the time and the position to try everything. He didn't go outside of Jehovah's laws at that time, but within those boundaries, he tried everything that was there to be tried, and he concluded it was vanity. The same thing happens today. Many wealthy people, they all they commit suicide, they get hooked on drugs, they're depressed. So. Pursuing pleasures is a waste of time. Okay. Sister Nat, can I cover you up? Brother Milo? So we can see that Solomon went overboard. He did everything that he wanted to do to his fulfillment, <clears throat> and uh, then he came up with that lesson that was just uh, a striving after winning. And uh, Jehovah was telling us now to be content with food, clothing, and shelter because our spiritual paradise is going to come through and our, our physical paradise is going to come through Jehovah. So I keep our spiritual self together and that's the most important. Good. Let's go on to paragraph 15. Jehovah wants to spare you the pain of learning life's lessons the hard way. Granted, you need faith in order to obey God and put his will first in your life. That faith is invaluable, and it never disappoints. Yes, Jehovah will never forget the love you showed for his name. So work hard to build a strong faith, and thus see for yourself that your Heavenly Father has your best interests at heart. He's a reader for Psalm 32.8, Brother Collins. I invite everyone to turn there and try to keep that scripture in my Psalm 32, verse 8. <clears throat> I will give you insight and instruct you in the way you should go. I will give you advice with my eye upon you. Okay, keep that scripture in mind. Paragraph 15, our question. Why is faith important, and what are its benefits, as mentioned at Psalm 32a? First, why is faith important? Brother Jacob? 
Well, you need faith to obey Jehovah uh, and put his will first in your life. And faith is the body of what never disappoints. Yes, good. Sister, uh, just call it her name. Fort Mary. And faith allows us to put confidence in things we can't necessarily see. Like in the first picture, the brother wasn't there at the moment serving where the need was great, but his faith and confidence in Jehovah allowed it to become so real in his mind that it affected the life course that he would pursue. Mm -hmm. Yes, very good. Uh, Brother Fig? So the world uses a term called the school of hard knocks, but Jehovah wants to spare us and young people the, the, the strife and the hard harm that can come from making bad decisions. So uh, certainly as, as we use the Bible with faith, we turn to it, uh, as Psalms helps us appreciate, we can walk with insight. We listen to Jehovah's instruction. We listen to his advice, and thus we can avoid some of the hard knocks, as it were, that many in the world face. Mm -hmm. Yes, and what will Jehovah be doing while you're showing insight, while he's instructing you, while you're walking in the way of uprightness? What will he be doing? Watching TV? No. What to say? <laughs> Brother, uh, let's see. That's what the people were. Okay. You're going to put your hand up. She's going to call on you. <laughs> Sister White. <laughs> it brings out how he'll keep his eye upon you. He, he's looking at us with, it, with his eye upon us, helping us to appreciate that. As an individual, he's helping us. Uh, he's concerned about us. He wants what's best for us, and he has our best interest at heart because he does see us and what we're doing with his eye upon us. Upon us. Ooh, yes, good. Let's go on to our next subheading. God gives you true freedom. Paragraph 16. Where the spirit of Jehovah is, there is freedom, wrote Paul. Yes, Jehovah loves freedom. And he put that love in your heart. At the same time, however, he wants you to use your freedom responsibly, which is a protection for you. Perhaps you know young ones who view pornography or who engage in sexual immorality, high-risk sports, or drug and alcohol abuse. To be sure, they may enjoy a few moments of excitement or pleasure, but often that comes at great cost perhaps in the form of disease, addiction, or even death. Clearly their freedom is a cruel self-deception. God gives you true freedom, paragraph 16. Why should we value freedom and use it wisely? Let's get to Brother, um, tell me your last name. Uh, Ian. Brother Ian. Yeah, um, well, he wants us to use our freedom responsibility and it's a protection for us but we got to use the freedom wisely in, our, in the best of our ability. Okay, yes, good. Brother uh, Gardner? Well, if we use our freedom responsibly, we, it can lead us to true happiness. But if we don't use it wisely, it can lead us to dangers such as disease, addiction, or even death. And all this freedom is just self cruel deception made by Satan. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Good. Sister Matt? And Galatians 6, 7, and 8 says that God isn't one to be mocked. And the insight book brought out that um, mocking God means that we're falling into that dangerous thinking that. Um, godly principles can either be treated with contempt or we can successfully evade the consequences. And we know that that's not possible. Ignoring Jehovah's counsel, um, sowing with a view to the flesh, means that we're treating his instruction as contemptible and we can't escape from the consequences of those actions. Yeah, so see, a lot of young people, they take a lot of risks, don't they? They want the adrenaline rush, rock climbing, right? And you slip, oh well, right? How many times you get to pull your cord for your parachute if you jump out of plane. How many times did it get to open correctly? Right? So 
when we think about how Jehovah uh, looks at us to guard our lives, to view life as he does, we can really appreciate that we don't have to worry about the consequences that come with that. So clearly, what kind of deception does the world have? Deception of their what? But we have the right kind. Sister Taylor? It's self-deception because they feel like they're not going to suffer the consequences for their actions. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. Isn't that true? Okay. Yeah. Uh, final comment, Sister uh, Gardner? And they have a false pride thinking, well, it's not going to happen to me. I'm going to be able to handle it. Um, I, I found this interesting because we interviewed a brother, a young brother, and um, he said when he turned 18, he was trying to figure out what choice to make. Uh, he had his family in the truth, and he had family that were worldly. And he said that he saw the consequences of what the family that was worldly was dealing with. And he saw what was going on with the family and the truth. And he decided he, he didn't feel that he really loved Jehovah yet. But he made his decision to serve Jehovah because of what he saw, the consequences, the good consequences. And he ended up developing a relationship with Jehovah, going to Bethel and doing really good spiritually because of what he saw, of what you reap, what you sow. Okay, thank you. Remember, God gives you true freedom, doesn't he? Okay, let's go on to paragraph 17 and 18. By comparison, how many people do you know who became sick because they adhered to Bible standards? Clearly, obedience to Jehovah is both helpful and liberating. What is more, when you use your freedom wisely, that is, within the bounds of God's perfect laws and principles, you show God as well as your parents, that you can be trusted with more freedom. In fact, it is God's purpose ultimately to give his faithful servants perfect freedom, described in the Bible as the glorious freedom of the children of God. Adam and Eve had a taste of that freedom. In the Garden of Eden, how many restrictive commands did God give them? Just one. They were not to eat the fruit of one tree. Would you consider that single restriction harsh or oppressive? Of course not. Compare it with the countless man-made laws that men have been forced to learn and obey. Paragraph 17 and 18. How is obedience to God liberating? Sister Hemingway? show how healthy and liberated it is when um, we do um, look see Jehovah's boundary and our freedom is wisely done by God's boundary and it shows our parents and God that we are able to trust and be able to see the freedom the way they do. Thank you. Sister Campbell? I looked up that word liberating and it means to free from social or economic constraints or discrimination. And it also means to be set free from imprisonment or bondage. So in Jehovah's organization, we have that room to move around and truly be happy in his organization. Very good. Okay, our B question says, how does the freedom initially enjoyed by Adam and Eve compare with that of humans today? Sister Garrett? In the Garden of Eden, Jehovah only gave them one command, not to eat of this one tree. That was the only restriction that they had. But we now, now we have laws that we have to remember that this is, there's a law here, and there's a law there. There's so many restrictions on us. And so Adam and Eve got a chance to have freedom, and they lost it. Yeah. See, isn't that what happens all the time? Now they got new laws. You can't make a right turn. Don't cross in the bike lane. And that's just dotted. If, if it's not, if it's a solid line, you can't go in it to make the right turn. You have to wait till the light turns green. So many things to keep in mind. Sister Chapman, Carrie. I remember when I was younger, Brother Rick giving a talk and said the only thing that, you know, you think in the world we have so much freedom, the only thing that Satan can provide for you is death, whereas Jehovah can give us everlasting life. So we have to really look at it that way. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. So many things for We know we can go on and on. We got to move on. Let's go on to paragraph 19 and see what ways are being taught by Jehovah to become free people. 
Jehovah takes a very wise approach to his servants. Instead of giving us endless laws, he patiently teaches us to follow the law of love. He wants us to live by godly principles and to hate what is bad. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is a fine example of that teaching, for it addresses the root causes of wrongdoing. As King of God's kingdom, Christ will continue to educate us in the new world so that our attitude toward righteousness and lawlessness will perfectly mirror His. He will also elevate us to physical and mental perfection. Imagine, you will no longer feel the tug of sin or experience the horrible effects of sin. Then, at last, you will enjoy the glorious freedom that Jehovah promised you. Paragraph 19. In what ways are we being taught to become a free people? Hello, Larry. Well, instead of giving us endless laws, like the world, there's laws for everything, uh, Jehovah patiently teaches us to follow the law of love. And uh, he does that by not just giving us laws, but he gives us the principles that are behind or what make up the law. Thank you. Sister Thompson. He also tells us to hate what is bad. Okay, okay. very good. Paragraph 20. Of course, our freedom will never be absolute. It will be governed by love for God and for fellow humans. In fact, Jehovah is simply asking us to imitate Him. He has unlimited freedom, yet He has chosen to be guided by love in His dealings with His intelligent creation. So it stands to reason that our freedom will have its fullest expression only when it is guided by Godlike love. Okay, our A question in paragraph 40. How does Jehovah use His freedom? Sister, Sister Kindness? No. She'll ask it again. Sister Matson. Sister Matson, she's so kind. Uh, Jehovah being the creator, he has unlimited uh, freedom, but yet he chooses to be guided by his love when he deals with his intelligent crea creation. Yes, very good. Our B question, how can you benefit from God himself? Israeli? Imitating that example, you know, using our freedom in a, in a loving way, uh, hating what is bad, doing what is right and good, and, um, and Jehovah sets that perfect example for us to follow. Yeah, it's very good. Let's go on to paragraph 21. Do you appreciate the many good things that Jehovah has given you? such as an abundance of spiritual food.